Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting lecture by Dr. Ronald J. Brown. Our topic for today is one of the grand avenues of the world. It is the Kienmen Avenue that goes down through the spot like a spine through the city of Beijing, formerly called Peking. So I tend to bounce back and forth. Uh, uh, sometimes I say Beijing, sometimes I say Peking. But this is one of the grand avenues of the world, like the Champs-Élysées, like Fifth Avenue, like Nevsky Prospect in St. Petersburg, like Paseo de la Reforma in Mexico City. These are the grand avenues. Of course, the Champs-Élysées being perhaps the grandest, although a lot of New Yorkers would prefer Broadway or Fifth Avenue. But Kinmen is one of the great avenues. So this is our outline for today's program. A little bit of background about China and the rise of China. So it's not if China will rule the world, but it's a question of when. The Sinocentric view of the world. How do the Chinese view the world? Why is Beijing so important? And then why is the Qianmen Avenue really the center of Chinese civilization and identity? The Forbidden City, and then out of the north, the northern part of Qianmen Avenue, and then the southern half, heaven, the temple of heaven. So, that's a picture of me walking down from the Temple of Heaven in Beijing on my big springtime trip through China. So let's get going on our visit to China. Well, China is ruling the world. The Chinese economy is growing. We see books such as When China Rules the World by Martin Jacques being translated into every known language on the face of the earth as people start getting used to the rise of China. As I speak now in November 2023, China is still on the rise, but the United States is still number one in so many other ways, in so many ways, especially militarily. But China is catching up fast. So it's no longer a question of if China rules the world. It is when China rules the world. When is this going to happen? Well, most Europeans are used to looking at maps like we see here on the screen. And this is a Eurocentric or an American-centric. The top on picture, you see the green and the yellow? That's the way Europeans would look at the world, putting Europe in the middle. On one side, the Americas to the South Africa and on the East Asia. Below that, we see an America-centric view with the United States clearly in the center of the map, with Canada and South America, Europe on one side, Asia on the other. Muslims view the world from their perspective, North Africa, the Middle East, and that is in the center of their maps. Well, I live in New York, so of course I view the world from the perspective of New York, as you see in the famous New Yorker magazine from 1976, showing that um, really, uh, when you look, when you live in New York, you look at the world as being centered on New York. But here again, each of us has our own way of viewing the world. Most Westerners praise Western civilization, 
spreading around the world. We invented the Industrial Revolution. We claim that we invented democracy, going back to Greece and Rome, scientific revolution, classic art. All of this is really very much of a Eurocentric perspective. And that's how we look at the world. And in a way, the world has become Eurocentric. The United States says its languages and religions from Europe. Africa has adopted the nation state as its ideal aims at democracy, spreading of education, um, computers and sciences, basically from the United States these days. Industrialization, which began in Great Britain and spread around the world, is the goal of every country in the world. So we've had a very long tradition of Eurocentric, which was then taken over by the United States after World War II and became an Americentric view of the world. Well, in the golden age of European world domination, it was France that took over a third of Africa and had colonies in Asia, took over Quebec. England took over another th uh, third of uh, almost half of Africa, the subcontinent of Pakistan, India, Burma, Australia, Malaysia, and eventually took over Canada and founded the United States. Spain dominated everything from California down to Argentina. Even little tiny Portugal had a giant colony in Brazil, as well as Angola and Mozambique in Africa. Russia spread across to the Pacific Ocean, deep into Central Asia. Even Italy ended up taking what is today Libya and Ethiopia. So when we view we Americans view the world, we view it very much in this context that the West has ruled the planet ever since the rise of the empires of Spain, Portugal, then later Holland, France, and Great Britain. The West-centric view of the world was spread around the world. Missionaries converted the whole southern half of Africa. The Catholic missionaries converted the peoples of South, Central, and even up into North America, as far as California, turning them into Christians. We built hospitals all over the world, bringing the marvels of modern medicine. Europeans introduced railroads, bridges, highways, transportation industries, and the schools training the little children to speak Spanish, Portuguese, French, English, Russian. This was the victory of Europe over the entire world. The United States got into the deal. We took over Alaska, grabbed Hawaii, overthrew the government, and turned it into an American colony flooding it with immigrants from the rest of the world so that today the Hawaiians are a tiny minority in their own country. We expanded into Asia, taking over the Philippines and lots of the islands of the Pacific. We took over Puerto Rico, we occupied Cuba, and we occupy Guantanamo Bay until today. We took over a big chunk of Colombia and declared it a new country called the Philippines or, or called Panama so we could build our canal. So the United States was very much a part of this European global domination. Well, what were the Chinese doing when all of this was happening? Well, they have their own way of viewing the world, a Sinocentric view of the world. 
China calls itself the Middle Kingdom. If you look at the map on the left, at the very center, you see a very small circle with some stuff written in it in Chinese. That is Beijing. Surrounding that are the Han Chinese, the majority of China, and then other uh, partially Sinophied people, such as Tibet, Mongolia, Taiwan. Above beyond that are tributary countries. These are the countries of Asia, which have traditionally recognized the emperor of China as their superior, and they paid tribute to him. These would be Korea, Japan, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Burma. Uh, these were the countries strongly influenced by China, but yet somewhat independent. The next ring would be other Asians, such as the Muslim people of the Middle East, uh, the Arabs, uh, the peoples of Iran. Then the next are the people, the big white ring there. These are the people who have had little influence from China, but yet are semi-civilized. These would be the Europeans um, and, uh, to some extent, the Americans. Beyond that are the peoples of the world who have not been influenced by Chinese civilizations, or very, very little. These would be the Africans, the South Americans, who would be considered barbarians by most Chinese. So this is a Chinese view of the world. The Chinese culture, Chinese civilization, is gradually expanding as people become more and more influenced by China, they will gradually be drawn in to a certain extent into Chinese civilization. So the Chinese view the world with Beijing at the center. So when we look at Chinese maps, uh, we um, have to really um, adjust the way we look. We look at the map on the right, sort of takes some getting used to, but the big half circle at the top, that is the Americas. And below that is Asia, with, of course, China uh, at the top of the bottom lobe. So if you turn this map uh, 90 degrees to the right, you'll see that China is really the central focus with Asia and Europe on one side and the Americas on the other side. The very middle of the map is not the Atlantic Ocean, but it is the Pacific Ocean. So China views the world in concentric circles. Peking in the center and Chinese, Chinese minorities, like the Mongolians, the Tibetans, the Muslims in Central Asia, overseas Chinese are still considered Chinese. All of the Chinese in Flushing here in Queens or the Chinatowns around the world. Chinese tributary countries are in the next ring. These would be Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Thailand. And then other Asians, which would be the people of India, um, Pakistan, and these countries. And then other countries which have had some Chinese influence. These would be, for example, Arabs and to an extent, um, some Europeans and Russians. And then the outer ring would be those countries and peoples of the world who have not been influenced by Chinese culture and Chinese civilization. Well, the Chinese are very proud of their civilization. In fact, the Chinese uh, language, 
Chinese writing, Chinese culture is considered by many the oldest continuous civilization on the face of the earth. Same language, same alphabet, same religion, same country, and uh, continuing into the future. Below that, you the map uh, on the right shows the great travels of a Chinese admiral uh, named Zheng He, who in the 1400s built this giant ship you see at the bottom. Well, look at the size of that ship and compare it to the another ship in the picture. That is the ship of Christopher Columbus. So when Christopher Columbus and the Europeans were sailing the Atlantic in these little tiny ships, the Chinese were building these giant vessels with thousands of soldiers and sailors and exploring Asia up into Mecca in Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the east coast of Africa. There's even someone that said that actually one of the ships went around South Africa, crossed the Atlantic, went around South America, back to China. But there is very little evidence for that. But the Chinese were a major force. When they went to Africa in these ships, they brought back giraffes and elephants to put in the emperor's zoo. So Chinese view themselves as having had a great culture for thousands of years and very proud of their cuisine, of their literature, their music, architecture, their education system, stability of the family. So Chinese are very proud of their history. <clears throat> well, the philosophical foundation of uh, Chinese society is Confucius, uh, Confucianism. Confucius, you see in the picture, lived from 551 to 479, B.C. or before the Common Era. He established what we call Confucianism. Now it is considered by many people a religion because it is highly organized with rituals and uh, temples and the whole works. But Confucius never claimed to be a god or a prophet. He was a historian and he came up with the theory of how a perfect earthly society should be organized. He didn't need a God to give him 10 commandments. He developed his own rules for society. It was hierarchical as the pyramid on the right shows. The top is heaven. Now, for Confucianism, heaven is not a place where you go when you die and you float around on a cloud and eat pepperoni pizza and Budweiser beer all day. Heaven for the Confucians, Confucianists is a perfect society here on earth. And everybody knows their place in this society. The emperor, or today the president, is at the top, and everybody else has their role. So, uh, society is organized around the family. And the family going back generations, where kids learn the names of their ancestors. Every house has a little shrine to their ancestors. So it was a very highly complex, structured society. This is a typical Confucius temple. When you go in, you see a book. There are no altars or no magical things. Uh, it's very much like a synagogue where you have the Torah scrolls. There is a book. If there is a statue of Confucius, it would be outside, such as the picture on the right, where you see Confucius, the great teacher, standing in front of his um, temple. 
But inside you see books, you see these stone tablets on the left with the teachings of Confucius written on them. Well, the golden age of China, going back three and four thousand years BC, continued up until Europe and America started taking over the world. They began, Europeans began with the Americas. French took Quebec, the English took the rest of Canada and, and what became the United States. Spanish took most of South America, Portuguese took Brazil, carving up the Americas into nice, neat little categories for the European powers. The Europeans also took over Africa. The picture you see, the pale green, those were the French colonies. The pinkish color beginning with Egypt down to South Africa was British. The Germans took Southwest Africa, Tanzania, Cameroon. The Belgians took a giant colony in the middle, which is today Zaire, or the Congo. Spanish took some chunks. The Italians took what they wanted. And so the Europeans simply carved up the North and South America. They carved up Africa. Well, then they started on Asia. The English took Pakistan, India, Burma, building their giant English empire. The French took Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. And later on, the French took over Syria. The English took over Palestine and Jordan and Iraq. And so the world was being carved up by the Europeans. The Russians expanded the whole way to the Pacific, taking over Siberia, which was part, which is part of Asia. Well, the Chinese were watching the growth of Europe watching Europe and later the America, the United States, taking over the world. And they started wondering, when are the Europeans and Americans going to try to take over China and chop it up into little tiny countries as they did the Americas and Africa and later the Middle East? This was the fear of the Chinese beginning in the 1800s, where Russia was going to take a big chunk. Japan did take over Korea and a big chunk of northern China. They thought the Russians were going to take over the Muslim areas. The English were going to expand from India uh, up into Tibet. The French would expand from Vietnam. And the Chinese were afraid that China was going to be chopped up by the Europeans. In fact, even the United States got involved in this. See the picture on the right? The United States invaded China. And, well, we didn't make a colony there, but we looted Peking. There you see the uh, Forbidden City walls with an American flag flying over it and American soldiers invading and taking over huge areas and looting them. So this is the big fear of China. The United States had no love for China or Chinese. We brought over tens of thousands to build the Trans-Siberian Railroad from California to New York. And then we expected the Chinese to pack up and go home. But when they stayed and built Chinatowns across the country, the United States went into panic and passed a series of acts in Washington to stop Chinese immigration, not allow them to become citizens, 
even to kick them out of the country. So on one hand, China was afraid of what the Europeans and the Americans were, had planned for China, and the Europeans were beginning to, to have influence in China. The French were eager to take over areas. The British wanted areas. The United States wanted influence. And so the Chinese were not in a good situation. <clears throat> Well, Chinese have always viewed themselves as the Middle Kingdom. And as we see today, we see the Chinese are out to take over Asia and take over the world. Made in China 2025 is going to be Make China Great Again. Huge infrastructure projects, ports, airports, highways, universities, the Chinese Silk Road, railroad links and sea links linking Europe and China through Asia. And so uh, President uh, Xi of China is out to keep America out of China, keep the Europeans out, and to make China great again. <clears throat> well, Beijing, as a great city, is really a microcosm of Chinese history. Here we see a drawing of Beijing. The middle of the picture, surrounded by the blue moat square, is the Forbidden City. Before that is the temple area, and in front of that, Tiananmen Square. And going down to the bottom, in the lower left-hand corner, that is the beginning of the Qianmen Avenue which goes north-south through Beijing, right through the Forbidden City. And above the Forbidden City, you see that little mountain? Well, the highway continues up until uh, the end of the map. So it is one giant highway cutting north-south through Beijing. Here's another picture of it showing it cutting right through with streets on both sides, but it is a giant, broad highway. At the top, you see the Forbidden City, you see the Bell Tower, and then highway going down to the very bottom, where you have the Temple of Heaven and the Temple of Agriculture. That is the Champs-Élysées of Beijing. That is the Fifth Avenue or the Broadway of New York. <clears throat> and so it is really the soul of Beijing. Here we see other maps which always highlight the Great Highway. On the left, you see at the very top are the Bell Tower and the Drum Tower to warn the city if barbarians come from the north. Forbidden City, Tiananmen Square, going down to the bottom were the Temple of Heaven and the Temple of Agriculture, the giant highway. On the right, you see the same thing, and you see the street surrounding this grand avenue. It is five miles long. So when you go to Beijing, uh, it is going to be a good walk. So wear good, solid shoes. At the far north, the Bell and Drum Tower, halls uh, na with names like Preserving Harmony, Complete Harmony, Supreme Harmony. These are the Confucianist principles of a well-ordered society. Then the Forbidden City, Tiananmen Gate, Tiananmen Square, Mausoleum of Mao Zedong, 
And then the highway continues, the avenue continues with big buildings and all kinds of uh, structures down to the temple of heaven and agriculture and the entrance gate from the south, uh, uh, the Yongding Gate of Lasting Peace. The temples and the famous buildings along the highway always have names which sound rather strange to Westerners, such as the Hall of Preserving Harmony, Complete Harmony, Supreme Harmony, Heavenly Peace, Temple of Heaven, Temple of Agriculture, the Gate of Lasting Peace. These are the principles of Confucianism, a harmonious, peaceful, prosperous society here on earth. So when you say heaven all over the place, once again, that's not a place where you go when you die if you are good. Heaven is something that you must create here on earth. Don't wait until you're dead to go to heaven. Build heaven. Confucianism does not believe in life after death. This, they say, is a myth to keep you lazy and stupid. Suffer through a terrible life here on earth. Accept it. Because when you die, you will then be happy. Chinese so say, oh, hell with that. We want peace, prosperity, happiness, all the pepperoni pizza we can eat and all the Budweiser beer we can drink. We want it here on earth, not after we are dead. Well, when you enter the city from the south, you encounter first the temple of agriculture. On the right at the bottom, you see the way it looks today. On the picture on the left, you see a much older um, picture of the temple. It dates from the 15th century, which would be the 1400s, the time of Christopher Columbus. Now, it is a temple of agriculture because agriculture was very important and very precarious. Remember, as a child, my mother would always say, eat your peas. Think of the poor starving children in China. Well, when I was in China, I asked uh, someone uh, what the Chinese say to their kids to get them to eat their peas. And they say, oh, in China, we say, think of the poor starving children in the United States. So this is the entrance into the main avenue, beginning with the Temple of Agriculture. Well, agriculture was so important that one of the emperor's big jobs was to leave the Forbidden City, <clears throat> go down the Kinmen Avenue to the Temple of Agriculture, where the emperor had his farm. He had to put on his boots and his hat and go out and cultivate his rice paddies to show that the emperor's responsibility was to make sure that everybody in his empire had enough to eat. And so that was one of the big rituals of planting the rice that even the emperor participated in. <clears throat> Across the avenue is the Temple of Heaven, which also goes back to the 1400s. This is me during my visit uh, in the spring of 2005. Now here again, the temple of heaven is not talking about <clears throat> heaven up in the sky where you go when you're dead. It is creating heaven on earth. It's one of the rare round Temples. Most temples in China are square or rectangular, but this is the temple of heaven, showing that everything is included, the completion 
of a circle. There are no edges, no distance from the center. It is all one rising circular building, always with the steps going upward. Well, as you walk up the Grand Avenue, you pass palaces, banks, and all kinds of buildings. Well, then you get to Tiananmen Square, which is the largest square on the face of the earth. On one side is the National Museum. You can see it on the left. This picture is taken from the um, balcony of the Forbidden City. So on the left is the National Museum. Absolutely fantastic uh, museum, sprawling, huge. On the right side is the Great Hall of the People. This is the seat of the Chinese Congress, one of the largest buildings in the world. In the middle is the mausoleum, or the tomb, of Mao Zedong. Tiananmen Square dates from approximately 1651, and it was historically the center where the people would gather for major events. In the middle of Tiananmen Square is the mausoleum of Mao Zedong, right in the middle of the Grand Avenue. So when you come up the Grand Avenue, you have to go around the mausoleum. Inside, you see the mummified body of Mao Zedong. You see the guards standing around it with monuments. When I was there in 2005, if you were a foreigner, there was a special line where you were allowed to go in. You couldn't spend any time there. You basically just walked by the mausoleum. But there was always a huge line of Chinese to get in. Mao Zedong was the man who expelled foreign influence, and made China great again. He made his mistakes, but he was the one who defeated the Japanese in World War II, expelled the missionaries, and set China on the road to industrialization. And so he is still revered as the man who made China great again, or at least set its on set the country on its way to becoming again the city and the country at the center of the world. That's me again in front of the um, mausoleum of Mao Zedong. On the left, you see him in the Great Hall of the People with the hammer and sickle of the Communist Party, the red flags, with everybody standing at attention as he gives a speech or whatever he was doing. And so Mao Zedong is still venerated as the great liberator of China. Also in the middle of the avenue at the Tiananmen Square is the monument to the people's heroes. The Chinese consider the period of about 1840 to 1940 as the period of humiliation. The first opium war of 1839, this was when Britain France, Germany, and later the United States forced China at the point of a gun <coughs> to accept opium, to make opium legal in China. Because the British were producing tons of opium in its colony in Pakistan and in India, and it wanted to expand the market. 
And so people like John Jacob Astor in the United States, business people, started forcing China to open up its doors to drugs, to opium. And Chinese, of course, said no. And so the Europeans invaded, forced the emperor to legalize drugs. Well, the background of that is the United States has the same thing. We are trying to stamp out the drug trade and drug addiction. But yet the United States and the Europeans forced China to turn itself into a drug-filled um, country. So that, for the Chinese, was the beginning of the century of humiliation. The uprising of Jintian, 1851, another uprising, various movements to make China great again, get rid of European influence, the war against Japan, and Japan occupied huge chunks of China. Well, all of these humiliating experiences, the American occupation and burning of half of Peking, looting of the country in the year 1900, all left their marks on Chinese history. That is why Mao Zedong was so important. He expelled foreign influence. The only countries that were able to keep chunks of China were the British who kept Hong Kong, Portuguese who kept control of Macau, and areas in the north that the Russians took from China, but which China believes should be returned. Taiwan also remains a, a breakaway island, but it is still recognized as part of China. Both Macau and Hong Kong have now been returned to China. Taiwan remains semi-autonomous with the military support of the United States. So China really was put back on the map with Mao Zedong, and he ended the century of humiliation. And so this monument commemorates the victims of these many wars and uprisings. Well, after Tiananmen Square, you enter the Forbidden City, and this is the gate of heavenly peace. It passes over a bridge, which is part of the Grand Avenue, going five miles down to the south, up through the avenue to Tiananmen Square, the Mausoleum of Mao, and across the bridge into the Forbidden City. Once again, heavenly peace. Well, heavenly peace here on Earth. The gate itself and the Red Wall goes back to 1420, well before even Christopher Columbus, but it was rebuilt in 1651. Most of the temples that we see, and large parts of the temples, are made of wood. So it's very easy to replace one piece of wood with another. So the temple there, as it stands, um, could have pieces of wood going back hundreds of years, and then other pieces would be replaced uh, uh, as recently as yesterday. <clears throat> Well, in through the Tiananmen Square, the Tiananmen Gate, and into the Forbidden City. The entranceway and the avenue going through Forbidden City is called Chang'an, or the Avenue of Eternal Peace. Once again, peace here on Earth. And once you are in the Forbidden City, then you have the Palace of the Emperor. 
This is the meridian gate, the southern gate, which goes into the forbidden city itself. Now, the gates here are not monumental. They're just punched into the wall. So it's um, very modest. You think in the United States or Europe, or decorated with statues and everything. But it is this simplicity which is really quite uh, uh, impressive. Here again, you see the steps going up into the entranceway for the Forbidden City. Of course, now it's no longer forbidden. It's filled with tourists. This is a map of the Forbidden City itself. See in the middle of the picture on the left, you see where it's marked B, that is the Meridian Gate. Then you go through various other gates until you get into the Hall of Supreme Harmony, uh, the Hall of Preserving Harmony, with buildings on both sides. And so it is definitely forbidding, because it is surrounded not only by the red wall we saw, but also by a moat um, filled with water. And so this is the place where the emperors ruled. And we see some of the buildings in red, those red dots, were various buildings of importance. Various embassies were there of different countries. Now, of course, nothing was inside the central, um, what they call the imperial city confines, but it was a very important point to be close to the emperor, to be at least have a building as close as you could to the residence of the emperor. The first big hall in the Forbidden City is the Hall of Supreme Harmony. And this was the place where the emperor engaged in ceremonies. Now, we talked earlier about the ceremony of going down the Grand Avenue to the Temple of Agriculture and carrying out his ceremonies of planting of the rice every spring. Well, everything was highly ritualized. Every uh, movement in a grand ceremony, such as celebrating something uh, or um, um, accepting tribute from a foreign country. Uh, these were all highly choreographed and very elegant. And if you look at the picture on the right, you see that it is all made of wood and has to be constantly repaired and sometimes an entire pillar that's getting weak or old will be replaced with a brand new one and painted identically to the one which was there before. The second big hall in the Forbidden City is the Hall of Complete Harmony. And this was an area where the emperor went to rest between ceremonies. So he could go and sit down, maybe take off his shoes, uh, although he didn't take them off. He had servants who would do that, have some tea, because Every ceremony that the emperor had to do was highly ritualized. He had to wear certain clothes. He had to stand in a certain way. This would be very similar to religious rituals, where, uh, especially like with the Catholic rituals, 
where you have the priest and you have people swinging incense and people carrying books and turning to the right and standing and sitting and kneeling um, or in synagogue services like the Orthodox, very ritualized. You have to stand in a certain way. You have to uh, do certain acts. You have to be wearing certain clothes. These were highly ritualized. This was a hall for preserving harmony. And here was the area where the emperor would prepare for his imperial ceremonies. You didn't just get up, take a shower, rub your hands through your hair, throw on a t-shirt and shorts, and you were ready. You know, every item that you wore had a highly ritualistic role, had to be put on or uh, by a certain person in a certain way. Every bit of clothing was presided over by a high court official. And so to have the emperor get dressed or change clothes for a ritual was very complex. Well, then you get to the back door of the Forbidden City. Here you see the wall around the Forbidden City with a tower on each corner. Again, everything made of wood, although the wall is made of stone. And there you see it is surrounded by a moat, which uh, was, was defensive. You know, you had to find some way to get across it. On the right, you see one of the bridges which lead into the back door of the Forbidden City. This was the North Gate. And it was the gate of divine prowess. Prowess means strength in battle. Now, the uh, Chinmin uh, Avenue goes north and south. In China, the major and most devastating invading armies came from the north traditionally, from what is today Siberia, Mongolia. These are where the barbarians came out, such as Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun, who ravaged Europe. Well, very often they also went south and ravaged China before they set off to ravage, rape, pillage, and plunder in Europe. So the North Gate is called the Gate of Divine Prowess, or Great Bravery in Battle. The North was where danger came from. So as you follow the avenue after the Forbidden City, you cross the gate, uh, you cross the moat, and then you continue north and you encounter the drum tower. This one goes back to 1272. Here again, you see the bottom is made of stone and the upper areas are made of wood. On the right, you see one of the older pictures of it showing the avenue leading up to, through the gates of the tower, and continuing further north. Inside the drum tower are the giant drums which you see on the right. When they beat them, it echoes throughout the whole city. It warns them that a emperor, a king, or a gang of barbarians is invading the city once again from the north. And this was uh, very important because uh, the greatest danger for China 
throughout its history have been barbarians from the north. The Europeans coming in from the uh, east, from the ocean, was a relatively recent phenomenon, and the countries of the south have never invaded China, um, and from the west there were just deserts and uh, Muslim tribes and some cities, uh, but the real danger, historic danger, has been from the north. Just beyond the bell tower is the famous dr uh, uh, drum tower, is the bell tower. There again, you see it is a big stone fortress with three gates. But that bell inside, when it rings, you don't want to be anywhere near it. Because like the drums, the bell echoes throughout the city. And it warns the people a barbarian horde is approaching from the north. Get ready for battle. Well, Kublai Khan came from the north. It was a barbarian from Mongolia or Siberia. He invaded China. And from China, in the 1200s, European Middle Ages, he continued took over Korea, went down to the um, mountains, took over a big chunk of northern Vietnam, and then turned west, taking over what is today Pakistan, Iran, most of Turkey, devastating Kiev, the capital of Russia, and even the northern cities, such as Novgorod, and approached into Europe, going as far as Poland. And so this was one of the many threats to China that emerged from the north. These were the Mongols, uh, the Kublai Khan, um, but conquered China and not just invaded, but conquered it and ended up making, uh, ended up uh, making China part of a great Mongol empire. That's one of the reasons why in the north, beyond the bell tower and beyond the drum tower, the Chinese built the Great Wall to protect Beijing and protect the heartland of China from the barbarians who were constantly coming out of the north, Siberia and Mongolia, and attacking China. So that's the reason for the Great Wall. Here again, we see one of the ceremonies that the Chinese have reestablished. Most of these ceremonies in honor of the emperor and Chinese history were stopped by Mao Zedong as he tried to modernize the country. But now in China, they're reestablishing a lot of these ceremonies and rituals, but mainly for tourists. And here you see a um, dram dramatization of the um, emperor leaving the temple of heaven and visiting these various temples was part of the job of the emperor. One, one of the rare occasions where uh, people would actually see the emperor, where he emerged from the Forbidden City, went down the Grand Avenue, the Grand Boulevard, to the Temple of Heaven. Now, along the Grand Avenue, there are no religious shrines or temples. It's not like Fifth Avenue, where you have St. Patrick's Cathedral and uh, um, the Temple Emmanuel and religious buildings. Um, uh, along the avenue, it was just celebrating heaven on earth, 
and you didn't have to have a religion to tell you about heaven. But there are, on the streets off of the Grand Avenue, various temples. Here we see a Tibetan temple, which dates from uh, 1694. And there are many temples, whether they're Buddhist, such as the Tibetan temple, Confucianist, Taoist temples. There are even four Catholic churches in um, Beijing, um, one on each of the four corners of the city. On the right, you see a very uh, typical um, a plaque uh, that you see on a lot of old buildings. Um, you see the Chinese characters. Well, the other ones that look sort of like Arabic um, or another one, which I believe is Tibetan, um, they indicate the various languages of China. Um, for example, in Inner Mongolia, they, Inner Mongolia, they, they have the Mongol language or they have Turkish languages in the Western areas. They have Tibetan in the South. And in the southern area bordering Vietnam and Burma, there are various tribes who speak various dialects and other languages. Another temple is the Lao Tzu Taoist Temple, which is the White Cloud Temple. Here again, you see the three gates entering into the temple. This is um, Taoism. Um, is considered a type of divination. For example, um, you go to a Taoist priest and he will read your tea leaves or read the lines in your hand. And so people consult the Taoist priest for very ordinary um, events. A very famous temple is the Temple of the Sleeping Buddha uh, from 1331. Again, the three gate entrance. Uh, and uh, Buddhism entered uh, China from uh, northern India. Buddha was from northern India and was a prince and spread his teaching in India. But India never really embraced Buddhism but it did take root in neighboring countries such as China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Burma uh, became Buddhist uh, countries, whereas India remained predominantly Hindu. There are various Muslims in China, uh, especially in the West, where they are Turkish Muslims. Uh, but in China itself, there are many Han Chinese who have converted to Islam. And so you see the mosque, which uh, looks, you know, completely Chinese in architecture, but it is... Um, um, a mosque. You can see the writing is in Chinese, but yet, as all Muslims must, they pray in Arabic, even if they don't speak the language. This is one of the four Catholic churches, which go back to the 1600s. This is St. Francis Xavier, one of the great missionary priests of the Catholic Church, uh, traveled to China as did other um, uh, uh, priests, and tried to convert the Chinese. Well, the Chinese uh, remained loyal to Confucianism, but since Confucianism and Buddhism were not really religions, neither of these religions have a god, um, they're basically, in Buddhism, a way of living, and in Confucianism, a way of organizing a good society. So you could be a good Confucianist or Buddhist and still go to church on Sunday if you decided that you wanted to have a God. If you didn't need a God, well, then you just did whatever you 
uh, wanted. This is another temple of Confucius. You see, once again, the statue of the great teacher outside, and inside there are only writings about Confucius. Other religions are now present. You see the Chabad house of the um, Lubavitcher movement, uh, which opened below that. You see in the left, uh, one of these little house churches or Protestant churches, which are gradually growing and taking root. In the north, there are people who have converted to the Russian Orthodox Church. And so you see a rather simple Russian Orthodox Church uh, from the Harbin area in the north of um, China. So that brings us to an end to our exploration of Beijing, all centered around the Grand Avenue with all kinds of temples and banks and other buildings off to the side. There are no religious buildings on it. It is devoted to heaven on earth, building an earthly heaven here on earth. So when you go to China, you have to uh, take the walk of the five miles of the Grand Avenue. Now, China is noted, and Beijing especially, is noted for its pollution. So when you go to China, you have to get up early in the morning before all the cars hit the street. But the sun is already up, and so you can take some nice pictures. Because within a couple of hours, the atmosphere is polluted. So that was one of my wonderful trips, uh, which I took in the spring, traveled to China, traveled all over. On the left, again, that's me in Machu Picchu, top of the Andes Mountains in Peru. On the right, that's me when I lived in Switzerland for seven years, and that was the motorbike my friend Bernie and I had and went did all of the Alps and the mountains. So if you have any questions or anything, please feel free to contact me at ronbrownmedia at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you and to have a chat, uh, answer any questions that you might have. So once again, this is Ronald Brown logging off. Thank you for joining me on this exploration of one of the great avenues of one of the great cities of the world. Thank you and goodbye.